What's up, everybody? It's CMP with Craftmaster Productions and Studio12Tutorials.com. Don't forget to stop by Studio One Tutorials. Pick up your premium membership. It is 50 cents a day. And also, please don't forget to stop by CMPKits.com. Get yourself some trap chords for scalar, some soul chords for scalar. Um, get yourself some MIDI drums, some loops, compositions, and MIDI. Also, please don't forget to follow me on IG at Craftmaster3. If you have a request for Studio1Tutorials.com, um, if you need any help or if you just want to cuss me out, that is the place to get my attention. Now, what I want to go over with you guys today is the uh, three things that you need to know. You absolutely need to know when attempting to create vintage samples, right? So the first thing that I want to um, go over is the idea of a console workflow, right? So the idea of a console workflow isn't just putting a console strip on one of your ins on one of your inserts or one of your mixer channels in FL Studio and calling it a day. It's a it, it's a method of capturing the audio, which um, you know if we circle back and we and we talk about like what we're trying to accomplish. When we're making vintage samples is we're trying to make convincing um, samples that that do not sound like they were produced in a computer. We're, we're trying to like what makes them sound vintage is the fact that they sound like they were recorded in the studio. So the easiest way to do that is to start with a console based workflow. So what I mean by that is the way that console based workflows um, went in was you would have, you know, your guitar. And your synth, it was one cable, a mono signal. I'm going to do another video on that, though. Um, a mono signal that went into one channel. It was assigned one fader on the console, right? Uh, these consoles, they would then have um, preamps, EQs, compressors, gates, and... Um, effects of that nature so all of those um all of those uh effects would be used to um treat the sound before before it was recorded in order to get in order to get a nice tone um so that there wasn't a lot of things that had to have been done in the mix right um then once it you know once it was ran through the console it was then sent out via inserts right so this is where you get this is where you get the word plug in because you would literally be plugging in these different effects into the insert slots on your mixer board to be able to further, you know, compress um, different flavor of EQ, do reverb um, and all your different type of effects right that like that. Right. Then you'd be brought back into into your mixer channel. Right. So you could insert. That's why they call them inserts on your doll. You insert these plugins into into this chain right here and then you'd still be able to utilize your channel strip um effects on what you have added so after you've done all that and this is and this is occurring in in the console then you would come out to tape right and then you would go out to your vinyl press now why is that even important why should you care okay so if you're using um, if you're using tape style effects like um, uh, um, Apollo's like UAD's Oxide or the ATR 102 or, you know, uh, Sketch Cassette, DAW LP, DAW Cassette, RC20, Reels, Wires, um, what's going to what's going to make these work? the best and what's going to make your samples sound convincing and actually vintage is knowing where to place those in the chain right so you don't want to you don't want to put like your wobble tape plug in uh before your compressors you don't want to put it before your reverbs and things of that nature right you want to record to tape and then then you want to go to your vinyl plug in um and I'll, I'll kind of show you an example of how I set this up. Right. So in one of my in one of my change, say, uh, say, if we look at. If we look at one of my instruments here. 
so I use Omnisphere. I use Omnisphere as as my uh, as my pianos, right? I have I have the Keyscape library. I like to use Keyscape inside Omnisphere. So this is kind of like my piano section, right? So on so on my piano mics, I'm recording into this is the first plugin in in my um chain, right? Now if you read the manual on this and if you use it, this isn't like an RC20 tape, right? This exists purely to simulate the effect of when you put this on all of your inserts, it makes your it makes your um your bland um DAW mixer react more like a console mixer where each channel is going out to one of these big two inch tapes. So that's so that's why this exists. It doesn't it doesn't add any wobble or um distortion or anything like that. It's just a light bit of saturation that's barely noticeable on one channel. But when you stack them all together, it's like the waves NLS, right? All right. Then I go down, then I go down and I have and I have my channel strip. So this is this is mimicking like um an ATI, I'm sorry, an, an API uh console. At the end of all that, right? And then you see I also have you know this Galaxy Echo and we'll circle back to this. Then I go in then I go into my wobble, right? So, you know, you reels is reels is good as a high pass and low fast filter and this is like a good you know wow wobble type of um plugin right if i want if i want to use that effect so then once i have all of that okay and i've got and i've got that texture down that all comes out to the big tape machine right and that's what that's what this is that's what this is for so if you look at if you look at the manual and you're UAD stuff, it tells you, you know, run an oxide on every single channel, have them sum to the Ampex tape deck, you know, for the for the most realistic um version of this plugin. And then we go from we go from mixing down to this tape deck over to pressing it on the vinyl. And what this does here is I'm not necessarily using this to wa to wobble and and uh and put noticeable you know flutters on the actual overall composition i'm just using this to introduce the noise and the cackle and give you know give that give that vinyl texture that this plugin does really 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 well um but if you don't have this you can use your rc20 um even even the free ozone uh um vinyl you could put in place of that right this could be this could be your slate tape or your uh, your waves like Abbey Road tapes or something like that. That's that's where you that's where you'd put this. Um, and then replacements for this would be waves NLS slate uh, slate console channel, the VCC plugins, right? So that's so that's number one. Number two is when you're when you're making vintage samples, you want to use vintage effects, right? Um, for as many places as possible, uh, because again, what you're trying to do is you're trying to recreate, you know, a recording situation from the 60s, 70s, 80s, whatever, 90s, whatever era that you're focusing on when you're creating this. So um, as often as possible, I try to use, you know, stuff like the Galaxy Echo, um, Valhalla Vintage, um, the the Valhalla um, Delay the vintage delay, which is, which is really great. Um, if I want distortion, I'm using like old, old pedals from the eighties. Um, just, just things of that nature. You want to really keep it. And, and even your EQs, right? You want to, I have this pro EQ here on all of my channels, just in case, uh, you know, if low end builds up too much, I could, I could hit it with the filter. That way I don't have to use like a plugin that taxes the CPU but you really want to use like you really want to use plugins like this the EQ right your you know your APIs or um or something or something like this your pull text right because because these are these are static curves and this is what this is what was used to make all of all of this music that you're replicating so if you go in um if you if you go in with an EQ like this and you start and you start getting, you know, really surgical and 
and making, you know, making all of these, you know, making all of these types of weird shapes and cuts like this. This wasn't available to an engineer at the time. So you're instantly going to be taking that source and changing it in a way that isn't true. Um, and it's going to lower the believability that what I'm listening to is something vintage, right? Um, the last and most important, the last and most important element of making a vintage sample is that when you are writing it, right? When you're, you know, when you're drawing your MIDI, you need to write it in a way that it lends to uh, playability, right? So if, so if you write, if you write one track, okay, and say you do, say you do a, uh, let's say you do a bass, a, you know, a bass line like this, and then you've got, and then you've got your chord progression going here, right? You know, and you do, you know, you do, you do something like this. Okay. So now, you, now you got your chord progression. This is all one instrument. And then you say, you say, okay, like now I need to do, I need to do some type of, um, you know, some type of top line melody. So let me, so let me go up here and do, and do, you know, all of this and put this out, right? What you gotta, what you gotta do is, okay put your put your hands on your midi controller and see and see if you could play this and if there's no way if there's no way that you could that you could reach your hands right and say you want to go like even higher with like this type of you want to do a lead up here and your midi looks like this boom if you can't if you can't like if you cannot play this with your fingers if you cannot get your hands across the keyboard in a manner where this is comfortable, that's not to say that you can't use all these notes, but what you need to do is you need to break these up into different instruments. And I'm telling you, once you do this and I see, I see a lot of you guys do this with guitars. Like you guys write these guitar parts that sound awesome, but you need three hands to play them. What I would suggest you do is you take is you take that is you take that part that you need the second hand to play, you select a different guitar, right? Or a different synth or a different bell or a different piano, and you put it you put it on another track and you put a different set of effects on it, right? So then so then you have this going here and you have this going here. And then what you can start to do is you can say, all right, you know, this is gonna stay in the middle, and then I'll and then I'll pan this to the right. And then, and then you can write a counter melody that's, you know, that's, that's going off of that and you pan that to the left. And now you'll start to have like a really wide and interesting composition that is, you know, full and rich rather than, rather than making a, a, um, a, a, a pattern like this and layering it like, okay, so I'm going to do this with a guitar. Then I'm going to layer this with a pad, you know, then I'm going to just, then I'm just going to take the bass notes and that'll be my bass line and. I'm gonna layer it with an EP too, right? So that is, those are the three things that you need to know to make convincing vintage compositions. This is CMP with Craftmaster Productions, studio1tutorials.com. If you guys have any requests, you need to join studio1tutorials.com. I don't do requests on YouTube. That's only for the subscribers. Vintage sample composition course coming very soon. You guys keep it simple, but do not be basic. And I will see you on the next one.